All right. So thanks everybody for joining. Let me, uh, why don't you guys give a quick intro just so for the benefit of people watching down the road, everybody knows who's who. So Aaron, when we start with you, what's, who are you? <laughs> <laughs> well, good morning. I'm Aaron Green. I am a uh, predominantly real estate attorney in Arizona. That's my bread and butter. I do a uh, little bit of estate planning and probate as well. Awesome. All right, Mark. Hey, good morning, Mark Spencer. I'm a CPA based out in Arizona. Own my own practice. Been doing this for 25 years. Help the self-employed and small business owners. And you know California too. You help me with all my California stuff. We so. do help in California, despite my love of the FTV. <laughs> yes. All right. And Juana. Hi, everyone. My name is Juana Brinalis with Brinalis Law Firm and located here in sunny San Diego. Practice business, trans- transactional business, and real estate. Awesome. Okay. So what I want to do is kind of walk through, you know, new agent just got licensed, let's say, never been in real estate, wasn't self-employed. So what what is the first step for that person in terms of mostly this is going to be kind of for purposes of taxation, right? But there's some legal entity stuff required to get that done. So is it best, Aaron, I'll start with you. Is it best for the person to go ahead and create an entity to get paid? In other words, like you kind of started a business, right? Now you're a real estate agent and you're you've got your own little business going. John's, you know, agent. So what should that person do first? Uh, should they go start a bank account? Should they go ahead and start an entity so they have their own like legit LLC up and running? Where does that break even point? You know, what's what's kind of step one? Yeah. So in my opinion, uh, you do want to set up an entity first. That's kind of the way to do it. Um, The way of thinking about it is that the law thinks that entities uh, are treated as as legal people. So, you know, you're actually talking to two people right now. There's Aaron Green, you know, me, the lawyer. And like, if you could get a chair sitting next to us would be the law office of Aaron Green Personal Corporation which again is treated like a regular person as well. Um, And the purpose of doing that is twofold. One is taxes and and I don't do tax law, so you can defer to Mark for that. Um, But it's also for liability standpoint, you know, if if you're doing something wrong, they sue you. If your entity is doing something wrong, they sue your entity. And it's a way of kind of establishing, uh, uh, limiting your liability. Uh, which is why we do LLCs and why every business typically is transacted in in an entity and not personally. Um, okay. So that's the the main purpose of it. And what's the cost? And so in Arizona, the Department of Real Estate is going to make you set up a PLLC, right? That's the entity you need to create. Am I correct there? The short answer is yes. So you there's different kinds of entities. There's corporations and LLCs. For the Arizona Department of Real Estate, if you want to conduct a real estate business, you have to have your license. Uh, You have to have the entity licensed. And the only entities that the uh, Department of Real Estate allows is either a PC, meaning a personal corporation, or a PLLC, which is a personal limited liability company. I recommend doing a a PLLC or a personal limited liability company uh, because you don't have to do annual reports. So I kind of screwed up when I did mine because I had no idea. So I just did PC. Uh, but now every year I have to do an annual report and pay 50 bucks to the corporation commission, which is Royal Pain for Life. So yeah. PLLC is the way to go. Okay. And there's two ways to do that. One would be to figure out how to do it on your own, which I'm not going to get into here. You could you know, spend hours down the Google hole if you want to figure that out. But uh, the other one would be to hire you to do that. And so uh, don't give a specific price because t- I want this to be sort of evergreen. Who knows when people are listening to this, but give me a ballpark. What what are generally speaking, what are the fees and attorney fees and, and state fees? Well, I guess yeah. both. So because there's it's not free to do it yourself. There are some fees you have to pay. What are those right. look like right now? So if you did it yourself, it's $85 is the expedited fee for the Corporation Commission, and there's no way to get around the expedited fee. So it's 85 bucks if you do it yourself. You can go online and and fumble through it and do it yourself. Um, And then in addition, you also have to fill out an application with the Department of Real Estate uh, to get the PLLC approved. So, you know, I typically would charge a flat fee of, of ballpark 500 bucks. And it would include that $85 fee 
And for that, I would create the PLLC. I'd kind of fill out the form for you. So you just got to take it to your broker to sign it yeah. and then submit it to the department. And then normally I would also send you the link to the IRS website to get it a tax identification number, which is like a social, so that it can then open bank accounts and other stuff. Yeah. But I always defer to Mark or your own tax person to see how you want it taxed and to help you do that. Um, yeah. Which is easy to do, but you got to elect. You want to get S Corp or partnership? I just want to get taxed. And I don't answer those questions. That's a more yeah. question. Okay. So step one, get your entity set up. And then we'll get to step and two in a second. And, and yeah, get your get it. And your license will actually be hung in the name of your entity. Right. So right. You, you'll start as a real estate license. You, you can even, let's say you're already licensed, right? That's fine. Mm -hmm. You get your entity set up. Once it's all legit up and running, then you just tell the department of real estate, there's some form I'm sure. And you tell them, Hey, you can call the department of real estate and they'll, they'll move it over for you. So, and you'll let and the broker the thing, know. Part of my flat fee is I would print out the form and fill it out. So it's kind of yeah. there already. Make so then easy. you've got John Glutch PLLC, for an example, would be licensed, not yeah. John. John yeah. And, and good news, you don't have to come up with some cool name because the Department of Real Estate is going to make you call it your name. So you don't need to come up with super duper cool name. That's great for you. A lot yes. of real estate agents take six months trying to figure out what they should name it and figure out they're not allowed to name it anything. So, <laughs> all right. So let's figure out, uh, Wanna have, so talk us through the same questions in California. What's step one? And then what's the cost? I'm sure it's 10 times more because everything's more in California. Uh, so kind of walk us through that. What, what does that look yeah. like for uh, us? So I just want to start off, you know, congratulations to the newest newest real estate professional, right? I know, I remember when I got my license, it was very overwhelming, just learning these new terminologies, these contracts. And so hopefully this won't add, you know, more burden, but kind of some relief, right? Like you said, some guidance. So what's interesting in California to differentiate from Arizona is that, um, as a real estate salesperson, which is like the newest real estate professional, is um, a professional limited liability company is actually not an option. So in California, as you're doing all your real estate related activities, uh, you would be doing it under your individual name. However, with that said, you still can create a separate company, um, right? And this is what you know John is talking about, making sure that you want to really envision yourself as if you're working for a completely separate company, even though you are the sole owner, you want to treat it, um, you know, like you're working for the Glutch Group, right? Would you be using their company credit card for your personal uh, expenses? No, you would not. So for that reason, you want to keep, maybe just even keep it simple in the beginning, get a shoebox, just throw in all your re uh, receipts in there that's related to that company. Um, and then, you know, you can, um, as far as keeping track of mileage, one personal favorite of mine is using Mile IQ. I believe it's free for certain mileage and beyond that, you know, there's a lot of um, great tools out there for you. But um, so as far as creating the separate company, so what you would be doing then is be working for that separate company, whether it's an LLC, or an S Corp. And I think what it boils down to, you know, and I'm sure that um, Mark will go into more of like the details as far as the taxes goes, but I believe something um, to really consider up front is what are your projected sales? I think working with the Glutch Group, you're probably going to have high projected sales. I know you're Thank bringing you. in about yes. like two, mil 2 million, right? Each year. Congrats on that. Yeah. Um, which is phenomenal. And so I think if you have high projected sales, it may be a great idea to sit down with someone like Mark. Um, I also have a great referral, someone here locally in San Diego, um, because there'll be different tax, you know, benefits in, in regards to that. Um, and then creating it is actually very fairly simple. However, people again are just overwhelmed with like the whole process and the research and so forth. But the um costs are pretty similar actually in Arizona. It's just oh. that the attorney's fees, you know, are, are gonna vary depending on which um, attorney you work with. Okay. And that's something you provide, right? You could, if someone could just email yeah. you, call you, whatever, and say, Hey, just do this for me. Right. And you're yes. the pro and you'll get it done. Great. Yeah. Okay. And so there's no, so in California, it's not real clear whether it should be a corporation or an LLC. It's not quite as black and white it, that that's going to vary more. So you what? can create an LLC or an S corp. Um, and then your broker, such as you, the Glutch group, your broker, uh, you, you would be paying those commissions to the company. Yeah. So we're, I'm not the broker. We, we're just a team. So EXP would be okay. paying the, would be paying the, so, okay. but they're okay. So what would be, why would you ever do a C corp or is, I don't know if it's S corp or C corp. Why would you ever do a corporation as opposed to an LLC? Yeah. As and a real I think agent? 
Yeah. So as far as like the tax benefits goes, Mark, maybe, you know, um, better at being able to answer that. But as far as like the S corporation, the taxations and how that's taxed, it's usually just as a pass through entity. Um, and so, you know, Mark can probably go delve a lot more into like the, the differences of the taxation aspect of it. Um, so but generally people will do opt for the S corp. But you can be an LLC in yes. California. Oh, well, that would Mark, that would be better, right? Because you can elect to, we can elect to, or I'm getting a few steps down the road, but that's okay because it's relevant. So you can elect as an LLC to be taxed as an S corporation. So that's what I do. I have a PLLC in, in Arizona, which is really not any different than an LLC um, tech for, for all intents and purposes. LLCs are great because they're simple. Is that, is that true in California as well, Juana? Like the benefit of an LLC would be you don't have yeah. a yearly rec reporting requirement like what Aaron was talking about. I mean, it's just simpler, right? Yeah, exactly. The maintenance okay. of it. Yeah. Okay. So from a maintenance perspective, the LLC is better. From a tax perspective, Mark, tell us why an S corporation would be better and why you get the best of both worlds by being an LLC who chooses to be taxed as an S corporation. Sure. So maybe just a, a little back and I'll pick up kind of where Aaron and Juana, you know, kind of kind of leave off. So great. We're going to go form a legal personality, an, an LLC. You know, here in Arizona, almost everybody kind of starts a PLLC, but we have this legal persona. Great. That's what it is for legal purposes. Now we get to talk about, hey, how are we going to have that personage taxed for tax purposes? Without doing anything, we can make this thing just disregarded. It's great that you have an LLC or a PLLC that's neat for liability purposes. I, I actually like all my clients to get one li literally just for identity theft. I mean, the fewer places you can have your social security number out and about, you know, sort of the better. But once we establish that, now we get to make a choice about, hey, how do I want to have my, my person, my LLC, my business thought of for tax purposes? And this is not a once and done decision. Oftentimes, we'll start out as saying, hey, my LLC, my, my business, we're going to ignore it for tax purposes, and I'm going to file a good old-fashioned Schedule C, just like I didn't have one. So you have a legal thing, and you have a tax thing. The tax thing at the moment just happens to be disregarded. As you progress, there's sort of some math involved about, hey, at a certain point, your numbers start justifying sort of the hassle of having to file as an S corporation. And I'll come back to the benefit of filing as an S corporation. So for example, hey, I did $25,000 in uh, my first year. I just get enrolling. Really not a lot of reason to go be taxed as an S corporation. Second year, as you've done exactly what John has told you to do, lo and behold, your commission income is three hundred thousand yep. dollars. Hey, now we're going to make an election. It's literally one piece of paper that we're going to send off to the IRS and said, "I want you now to think of my LLC as if it were an S corporation, but for tax purposes." Which just means I'm going to fill out the S corporation tax paperwork, just like I've been a corporation that elected S corporation status since the beginning of time. So you kind of got to remember, you start out as one thing, you can elect to be another. Now we don't get to bop back and forth, okay? We're cautious about making that jump and then we're probably gonna stick with it for the life. What's the big difference? The big difference is when you are disregarded for tax purposes, you are not an employee of your company. You and the company for tax purposes are one and the same. Most of the deductions, quite honestly, are very similar. Juana, I'm a huge fan of mileage IQ as well. Uh, if you're in this business, if you're an agent, you should have a mileage app. If I was the IRS, I'd come in and say, hey, I only want to talk to you about three things, your mileage, your meals, and um, probably your client gifts. All right. So, hey, we're successful. We've made the election to be taxed as an S corp. Two big differences. Number one, the S Corp files its own separate tax return. Okay. It's just a different piece of paper, a little more complex. Number two, you're now an employee of your company. You need to receive a good old fashioned paycheck. Lots and lots of theories out there about sort of what that paycheck needs to be. That really is um, dependent on a lot of sort of different things. But anyway, 
you're going to be an employee of your company. You're going to receive a W-2. If there's money left over after that W-2, you'll receive something called a K-1, which has the resulting profit of the company. You get taxed on the combination of those two. And the benefit is you save some taxes by doing that to make it simple, right? Sure. So you hit a certain sure. income. And it makes sense to say, hey, I'm an employee of my own company. You get taxed one way on that income, your salary, and you get taxed another way on the money you make as an owner of that company. And it saves you some dough, right? That's what kind of what it boils down to. Can so be. back to the back to you, Wana. So unless I'm missing something, people in California should do an LLC <laughs> and, and elect. And then at some point, if they're making enough money to elect to tax tax it as an S corporation. Is that, am I missing something or is that generally what most folks would want to do? Yeah. Um, I think LLCs make a lot of sense again, starting out, um, you know, depending on what their goals are and the objective of becoming a real estate agent. Um, but yeah, certainly there will be, um, the LLC will provide that, the, the liability protection, obviously. Um, and, and then, you know, as far as like the tax benefits and how much you're making, if it makes sense, certainly then you can opt to be taxed as an escort. But I think um, a lot of people may start there. Okay. Got it. Okay, great. So the the majority of what I want to cover next is tax stuff. So I'm going to let, I'm going to let uh, Aaron and Juana go, but let me, before I do, what, is there anything else that you can think of common mistakes things people should avoid, just general wisdom as people are getting started with their entities or maybe even maintenance uh, of the entity once it's up and running. You know, what are, maybe both of you could give us kind of your parting words on general words of wisdom there or any, any question I should have asked that I didn't for people who are getting started here. So Juana, anything I missed or anything that you generally could give people some advice on here before you go? Um, I would just say you have to keep in mind again, um, if, if for whatever reason, if, if you end up in court, right, I always have to think worst case scenario, and then the LLC is being challenged, is it p- truly being treated as a separate entity? And if you're commingling funds, if you're not, you know, keeping up with like the minutes or just like the basic minimum requirements, then what, you know, can happen is piercing the corporate veil, that liability shield would be gone. And then your personal assets can, you know, actually be um, liable um, for any judgment that may be. Um, rendered against you. And so it's just keep, again, just having that mindset of, hey, this is a separate company. I need to treat it as such, keep everything clean and and, and no commingling. Yeah. And we're going to talk, uh, uh, I'll talk with Mark about how to keep the books here in a little bit, which is, would be the commingling thing you're talking about there. But as far as keeping minutes goes, is there a requirement if you have an LLC for keeping quarterly or yearly minutes or any, is there any maintenance requirement for an ongoing LLC or corporation in California? Uh, yeah, so you're going to have to depend on what the um, the operating agreement, whatever it is that you draft, you want to abide by the operating agreement. Um, and, and certainly, you know, in there, I would I always just recommend to people at least to just do it once a year. That's always a great recommendation. Yeah. Okay. So that's something that you could set up as you're setting up an entity for somebody, you would kind of give them the direction of, hey, once a year, you're going to want to hold hold a meeting and here's what that meeting is going to look like and you record you know how the meeting goes and you file that away in case you get sued one day right you'll get you kind of give that direction in the beginning yes. and it's pretty simple it doesn't take a lot of time yeah yeah awesome okay aaron how about you anything i missed or any uh, anything we need to be thinking about on an ongoing basis with these entities no i, I just want to piggyback on what wana said which is exactly right it's a separate legal person so it's got to get its own you know, EIN tax identification number. So it's a separate person. It opens a separate bank account. You keep it. Uh, business is all through that bank account, uh, income and expenses, and it's all separate from your personal. You really want to treat it like a separate person and you kind of have to. And I think that's kind of what some people miss is they go to legal zoom or they do it themselves and they, you know, they, they do it, but they don't ever use it which it's worthless then. It doesn't do anything yeah. for you and it, it is going to create more problems than you have. Yeah. So, and and again, the EIN is the employee identification number, which is like a tax. It's like a social security number for your company. And that's something that, that uh, Juana or Aaron would, would do for you if they were uh, working for you to set up these entities or they would point you in the right direction. But that's you know easy enough to Google how to get one of those. Uh, but it's really a, a ta- separate identity, a separate tax identity for your entity. So, and that, and you have to have that in, in the order of events is set up the entity, get an EIN, open a bank account. 
right? That's kind of the process. So great. Yep. Well, hey, uh, thank you guys. I'm going to let you two go. And uh, Mark and I will get into some of the gritty, uh, nitty gritty on taxes. Thanks for joining us, you guys. I appreciate it. Pleasure. Thank you for having us. All right. We'll see nice you. you. Bye-bye. All right. So Mark, we got the EIN, set up our bank account. And when you set up your bank account, it's going to be, um, they're going to ask you what kind of entity it is, right? And all that stuff. And you just, they're probably just going to care about the EIN. Just, just a okay. quick, um, a quick note of caution. When you're applying for your EIN, if your attorney is not doing that, and you're going to go do that, I would say press the pause button because you can click through about twelve different uh, boxes on the IRS website. You'll have an EIN number, but every year I get you know a, a document from a client, and they go, "Well, here I applied for this." And the next thing you know, they're a C corp or a partnership or something they didn't mean to ever be. Yeah. If you have any questions, call your accountant, call your CPA, make sure that the accountant and the attorney are working together. You just don't want to set up an EIN that sort of puts you in the wrong box. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Great, great advice. Okay. So get the EIN, get the bank account going. The second thing I, I, I would suggest that people do and can confirm with me here is like set up a, a credit card, a business credit card. I mean, if you don't want to have a credit card, then use a, a debit card on your, you know, for your business, but have some, if you're going to use a credit card to get the points or whatever, have a separate credit card. And in my, mine's not even a business. Maybe it is. I've had business ones and I've had regular ones. It doesn't really matter. As long as you have a credit card that is specifically for business or a debit card that is specifically for business, that really helps with the books. And, and by that, I mean, somehow you got to keep track of your business expenses. And to me, the simplest possible way is just to have a separate account for it. Is that what your advice would be generally? Yeah. Keep, uh, listen, I get it. Uh, especially when you're starting out, no banks hand out credit cards that are just in the business name. Okay. You're the business, the business is you from a banking perspective. So yeah. if you don't end up with a company card, pick one of your personal cards and dedicate it. Um, there's nothing worse than saying before the IRS and go, oh, no, 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 no. That meal is business, but these other 14, those are personal. And, you know, trying to prove that you're not co-mingling is just always tough. So I yeah. think like a business owner, this is what businesses do, right? We pay yep. business stuff. So you set up a separate account, separate uh, credit card if you want one. Now, uh, you got to start tracking all your expenses and all your income. Yep. So I use QuickBooks, which QuickBooks Online, which I think is is far easier to use than... than um, QuickBooks uh, desktop. Uh, that's just my experience. But in general, what's the simplest way for people to track? I mean, it could be as simple as like you have your own bank account, you have your your business credit card, and you just print out the statement. You know, but that's uh, you know wh what range are you seeing? What, what what's the best way for people to get going tracking these expenses? Sure. Uh, listen, in this day and age, you don't need a shoebox. You shouldn't be using a shoebox. Um, <laughs> Listen, QuickBooks Online, zero, fresh books, you know, the, all, all this QuickBooks Online is 30 bucks a month. Again, business owners, we we track what we do, right? Yeah. Whether it's your productivity, hey, how many calls, how many, pro whatever. And your financials are no different. Yep. Any of those will work. There's some apps out there, you know, sort of as well. But the two pieces of tech that I'm going to want you to get into, probably QuickBooks Online or zero are probably my two favorites. And then a, a mileage track. Uh, mileage IQ is kind of the most popular one, but something out there. Yep. Okay. So you're going to set up, you're going to sign up for your software. You're going to put the software cost on that new business credit card you got or that new uh, business debit card, right? Because that's a business expense. Absolutely. And every month that those online programs are just going to, or every day, they're going to funnel in all your expenses and you're going to categorize them. That is called bookkeeping. So bookkeeping is what is keeping track of all those expenses. In the beginning, it's probably not rocket science. Pretty simple. Some Googling online could probably help you do a decent job of that. Or if you just want someone to do it for you, uh, then I know your firm does it. And also there's some online firms that you know can do your bookkeeping for you. Probably you get what you pay for to some degree there. Any any advice on bookkeeping? Should people do it on their own or should they hire somebody? You know, you know, I see a lot of progress, you know, with in agents. So it might be, hey, for that first few months, give it a shot. My only plea is whatever it is, make sure it goes through the business bank account. We can help with what we know about. Yeah. But yeah, as you progress, the things sort of get a little more complicated. You, number one, might just save yourself 
uh, aggravation come tax time if you've got a professional doing it, let alone, hey, are we catching stuff that you didn't know about? And finally, just, just making taxes cheaper to do. Yeah. At yeah. some point, we got to figure out what bucket everything goes in. Yeah, right. Because if I'm if I create these super messy books and I send it over to you at tax time, to which for sure, in my opinion, nobody should be filing their own taxes. It's just insane to me that anyone would do that. It's it's so affordable, and um, the the amount of hassle you could cause yourself filing your own taxes, it's just not worth it. And if I give over a messy set of books to you, it's going to cost me a lot more money than if uh, it's real clean, everything's simple, you know, looks good. So uh, I, you know, in general. I would say most people could start off on their own because they're not going to have too many things funneling through their books. But the other thing is you're probably going to miss out on opportunities if you're not getting advice from a CPA or from a bookkeeper. Um, and so let's talk about that for a second. The, the Here are the things that I know of that most people should be, should be writing off as agents, right? So mileage and that mileage would be defined as uh you know work you're doing for your well why don't you define it what 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 can you write off in terms of mileage yeah sure so mileage is essentially excluding your first and last trip of the day assuming you're going out the rest of those miles are deductible where the irs gets you is when you look at the record keeping requirements they literally say if you didn't document it when it happened it's not deductible hence the mileage iq thing I'm staring at a presentation that I give to, to realtors and I said, hey, defend your mileage deduction. It's your single biggest you know, deduction, you know, sort of out there. All right. And then and how so, often do you need to track? You don't need to track every mileage all year, right? Oh, no, no, you do. You do. That's okay. the beauty of the app. You get in, literally it says, hey, I see you're driving. It's like left or right. I mean, hey, you know, it's business or personal, which business? So and it used to be having... I haven't written off mileage in a long time, but the, it used to be that like you had you could do two months. There was some sample size that was allowed. Is that not the case anymore? You don't want to rely on that one court case from uh, many, many, many years ago. No, you should track it all year. Okay. And then watch the revenue agent faint when you hand them the mileage log because it ends the conversation. You don't have to talk <laughs> yeah. about mileage after that at all. And you said excluding your first and last trip. What do you mean by that? Yeah. So um, if uh, let's just say... I don't know, for some weird reason, you actually go to your broker's office every single day. I know that's not your situation, but yeah. we'll use me. I come to my office every morning. I go out and go see clients, run errands, uh, and do all kinds of things for the business. And then I drive back home. Mm. My trip coming into the office is personal mileage. That's commuting. When I go mm. home at night, that's personal mileage. That's commuting home. All the stuff that I do in between there for the business, those are business miles. Okay, so, but what if you don't go to the office? What if you, you have a home better. office and you're just going to show houses? Yeah, so the benefit of the home office is not the home office deduction. When, when we're going through this, and this really only applies to sole proprietors, uh, you're, when you're LLC, you're saying, hey, I'm not gonna be taxed as an S corp. The value of the home office is actually not the home office. It is because then everything you do when you leave the house for business, it's all business mileage. So if I worked out of my home to go back to, to my example. Well, now everything I do for the business, all those miles are deductible because I don't have a commute because the minute I walk literally from my kitchen into my office, that was my commute. I didn't <laughs> drive. I just took off my slippers. Yeah. That's going to be the case with most agents is they're not going yeah. to the office every day. They're working from their house, you know? Yeah. So, okay. So, so you could really track all your mileage and, and that's all going to count, you know, all the showings you do. And if you, if you only go to the, you know, like, let's say we have a team office, for example, but people aren't working out of there. They might go there to pick up open house signs or whatever, right. Or they go by there every once in a while. So you could write that off. Um, the, as far as the home office goes, you need to get two in the weeds on this because people can Google how to write off a home, a home office, but um, this is something they're going to want to do, right. You're going to want to write off that home office if you can. It, yes. Um, and, you know, just one sort of caution there is the IRS says, hey, it has to be either a room or a space dedicated for exclusive use. So it's not the spare bedroom where grandma comes to stay and you sort of baptize that as that's my home office. No, no, it's a home office. OK, it's a space that's used exclusively, you know, for my agent activities. Um, there's lots of different sort of um, things that go into that write-off. And there's also a thing where you can just get five bucks a square foot. But my big thing is, hey, exclusive use. Yeah, got it. Okay. Uh, all right. And 
who should EXP, who should the broker be paying? So our brokerage is going to pay commissions and those commissions in Arizona, I know they go to the um, PLC because our license is hung there. And maybe you don't know this in California, but do you know in California who should be getting paid? Uh, I guess I just would be very surprised. It's not again to the entity because the entity is the one with the license. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So in, in California, we'll have to check and see. Uh, I'm not, I think the entities get hung in the LS or in the, in the entity's name, but uh, ideally you want your entity to get paid, but let's say for some reason, the, 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 in California, they say, no, we pay the individual. In that case, you get the check written to you and you just deposit it into right your in LLCs. Business, a business okay. bank account. Yeah. Yeah. Business right. Bank account. You want all the income going in there as well as the expenses. Okay. Uh, let's see. Okay. Meals. So I know we're here. We are in 2021 enjoying uh, our full meal right off. Does that get last forever? And how does me, how do meals and entertainment work? What should we be doing to make sure we get those? Uh, yeah, sure. So, um, Hey, meals are sort of this little political hot ball here over the last couple of years, right now, this year and next they are hundred percent deductible entertainment's not. So next year too, 2022. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, great. Okay. Um, but I say all that because on the date that we're recording this, uh, President Biden's tax plan is being uh, discussed. So literally the world might change in the next three weeks. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but let's just talk about, because people think, uh, hey, um, I went out to my wife and we talked about business. Okay, that's not a business meal. If yeah. John and I go to, biz, uh, you know, go to uh, dinner, um, hey, there has to be a business purpose. Yes, we have to have a, um, uh, maybe a discussion about business but hey this would be the kind of thing where people in this business would go to conduct business okay now if john took me on a safari hunt to africa not going to be deductible not going to be deductible so um kind of like the mileage literally where the irs gets folks on meals is that we didn't document hey who what why like why were john and i having dinner what was discussed what's the business purpose those kinds of things, again, contemporaneous record keeping. They want you to write on the record, on the receipt. Why was that? Or go down your credit card statement. It was like, hey, John and I talked about, uh, you know, the presentation to his folks about taxes for realtors. Great. Yeah. So like what I do, and tell me if this is good enough, is in my Google calendar, there's, hey, met with whoever, here's why. And the why for me is, you know, often asking for referrals. My understanding is like, if I met with someone to try and generate business, like, Hey, do you know anybody looking to buy or sell homes? That's a business conversation. Is that accurate? Sure. And again, though, um, I can't have 14 meals with my best friend going, Hey, you have any referrals? To <laughs> right. Yeah. You got to have uh, 14 friends to go. Yeah, sure. Hey, prospecting yeah. is absolutely uh, yeah. you know, part of your game. It's, it's in literally what you guys are all about. Yep. Especially in today's market. Yeah. So I'm putting that in the calendar what I did. And then in QuickBooks, when it flows through on my thing, I'm putting in there, same thing, right? Met with the Smiths, asked for referrals. I And I'm only keeping the receipt if it's over $75. Is that all right? Sure. I mean, uh, you get into uh, you know, a revenue agent, some are going to be a little more um, persnickety than others. Yeah. And, and the way QuickBooks Online will let you save that receipt right into the app you know it's actually pretty cool you can just on the app you can take a picture and there it is so your receipts are all in one place and you know it's very easy to find so um so yeah that that's a real good opportunity for agents like you should be asking for referrals all the time so you know it's not a bad reminder to go out there and ask for referrals write the meal off and uh, also my understanding is you don't have to pay for the whole meal right you could go split skis you go half with somebody and you'd still you can write that thing off you know even if sure. it's dutch treat they call it okay uh, cool. And then tools. I think this is one a lot of people miss out on brokerage fees, uh, uh, software, you know, like the, the, the QuickBooks we were talking about, uh, you know, Zoom, all these things that all, you can write all that off. I'll tell you what, I'm just going to go through a laundry list of, you know, things that I Perfect. see. Broker, uh, MLS, Post, Dues, Continuing Ed, Popeye. Uh, advertising, bank charges, business cards, stationery, client gifts, cleaning supplies, open house supplies, lockbox, notary, photos, seminar, software. We talked about mileage, dues and subscriptions, your home office, bookkeeping and tax prep, notary postage, uh, insurances, uh, office expenses, travel, keys, inspections. That's off the top of my head. 
a lot of stuff, right? Yeah, you know, like your home office, all this stuff I got. All right, that's all write off, you know. So one of the things I see a lot of folks miss is they get a 1099 from the broker and they don't ever remember that all the stuff that they held out at close. Yeah. And because you didn't write a check for that, maybe you don't realize what it is. So yeah. I always ask my realtors, I'm like, listen, I want to see the breakdown from your broker of what they withheld out of your pay. Yeah. Yeah. Like for example, you a closing cost credit to the, to the buyer, you know, if you're going to pay for something that sometimes is not going to be reflected in your, it's going to show up in your 1099, which is the document that the broker gives you at the end of the year says, Hey, we paid uh, John this much. It's like, well, well, hold on. Some of that money went for this home inspection over here, you know, or whatever it was. Yeah, and that, that leads me to just one, kind of one caution that I have. Uh, you know, a lot of times you'll, you'll sell a property maybe for a discount for a friend or a buddy. Um, and how the closing statement reflects that's very important. Like, let's just say, hey, uh, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna rebate half, half of my, um, half of my commission. Well, if the closing statement shows, hey, here's your three percent commission, that's what your 1099 is gonna say. Sure, there's gonna be a one and a half percent give back to your friend. The IRS doesn't consider that a business deduction; they consider that a gift, which is not deductible that you just made to your friend. So just alter the agreement and get your one and a half as the commission hmm. over the commission. But the IRS isn't really all that keen on letting you go. Hey, I just, I gave a, well, the, you made them a gift. Good for you. You're a nice person, but we don't give you a deduction for that. So big question. Yeah. yeah. And that's a big tip. Yeah. Okay. Uh, all right. One, one thing I want to adjust to is not falling behind on taxes. I think this happens more than, uh, you know, our industry would like to admit people, uh, think they're doing great. End of the year comes and they, to get this big tax bill, right? So how do we avoid that happening? Sure, sure. Um, so when when someone steps, anybody that's being self-employed, uh, you know, I talk to them about, hey, understanding all that money's not yours. And, and hey, here's the kinds of taxes that are, you're going to be subject to. And here's the various general percentages. Differs a little bit if we're being taxed as an OS support, we're being taxed as a sole proprietor. But you have a plan, you know, for what that is. And just part of, in, in essence, people that are successful as realtors, you're always forward thinking. The next deal is coming. But where I see folks get in trouble is when they are paying last year's taxes with this year's commissions. Yeah. You do not want to get behind that eight ball. That's no fun. And so understanding, hey, when I get commission, I'm going to set aside this percentage that I've worked out with my accountant, and that's going to go towards taxes. I'm probably going to be sending those in quarterly um, or very at the very latest, you know, probably eight, April 15th, but all that money's not yours. And you need to understand roughly what percentage you need to set aside and then send off to the IRS or the state, you know, sort of at various times throughout the year. Yeah. And that percentage is going to vary based on how much money you're making. What what would be a baseline for somebody new? They're going to make under a hundred thousand. You know, what's the should they talk to an accountant about that, or, or what's how do they figure that out? You should talk to your accountant, but sort of rule of thumb, I'd say set aside thirty percent. And people okay. go, Mark, thirty percent. What are you talking about? Mm-hmm. Okay, two kinds of taxes. Number one, Social Security is fifteen percent, and then add income tax. Okay, that's just another 15%. This is before expenses and, you know, sort of about the, you get more refined as you get more specific. But if you just sort of set aside 30% rough math, that usually sort of ends up uh, close once we take out your deductions come tax time. So I would be setting yep. aside, you know, a third of the check. Okay, awesome. Okay, well, good. That was my last question. Is there anything I missed or anything I forgot to ask that you think would be helpful to add here? No, um, last point is just um, you form the LLC. You might start out being taxed just as a sole proprietor. That's not a forever choice. It's a great place to start. Mm -hmm. We then will make a choice based on essentially your revenue of going, hey, now it's time to be taxed as an S corporation. We can always go forward. Coming back is a little more painful. So that's not a one and done decision. It's not something you have to make immediately, even on the day that you apply for your EIN. To be honest, most times I say apply and have it as a disregarded entity. And you'll see that in the EIN application. We can always make the choice later on to be an S corporation 
lots of ways to get a late S corporation election made. You yeah. don't have to do that on day one. Yeah, that's a good tip. I wasn't aware of that, and but it makes sense. I just never really thought about it. And that's a great, I think it's smart. Like for most agents, like, let's just start, let's just get the entity going. You know, it doesn't cost that much to do it. And then you've got it, you're ready to go, you know? Yeah, so. start, start out there. Just again, identity theft alone is a good reason to get the yeah. entity. Yeah. That's great. Okay. Well, great. All right. So on this post, I'm going to link uh, information to your website and uh, everybody else who joined the call. So thanks so much for doing that. And uh, I appreciate it. Thanks for all your help. Hi, John. Hey, all right, see you. Bye. Bye.